Welcome everybody to this next plenary session of Stronger Things. I'm really pleased to be um, speaking with um, the renowned social geographer Danny Dorling today. Um, welcome to everybody who's just joining us now. Um, we're going to be discussing levelling up for real, community power and equality. And just before I introduce Danny properly, um, it's just I just wanted to say it's great. It's a great session to be doing anyway, but particularly brilliant to be following on from our rousing session this morning that we had with Professor Sir Michael Marmot, um, very much focused on the themes of how we would build back fairer, um, how health is a measure of societal success and really looking at the experiences of the more deprived areas of this country, how outcomes have been persistently worse for them, and um, how they've often been on the receiving end of the worst excesses of austerity policy. So I think hopefully there's a lot of themes that we'll pick up from this morning's session um, now. I would say the chat has been on fire throughout this conference, so please do keep on putting your questions and comments to Danny in the chat. Danny will be speaking for about 15 minutes or so, uh, but then we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So anything that occurs to you that you'd like to ask Danny um, while, while he's talking, please do pop it in the chat um, and I'll do my best to get to as many questions as possible. So without further ado, uh, it gives me a lot of pleasure to welcome Danny. He's a professor of geography at the School of Geography and Environment at the University of Oxford. Um, he has got many areas of expertise. He's a prolific writer been writing on issues such as um, demography, inequality, health, housing, Brexit, social justice, why Finland is a brilliant country to live in. Um, so hopefully we will be picking up on a lot of those um, areas in, in this discussion. Um, so I'm really looking forward to a wide ranging chat. Um, so without further ado, over to you, Danny. Uh, thank you ever so much. Thank you for inviting me. I really am just going to talk for 10 minutes, maybe 12, because I'm much more interested in chatting with you um, than what I, I think. Leveling up. Uh, what's the opposite to leveling up? Um, it's interesting to think what it is. It's not leveling down, but uh, if you type in opposite to leveling up on the Google, this is what you get. You get crumbling, crinkling, creasing, scrunching, squashing, folding, crushing, ruffling, rumpling, screwing, scrumpling, crimping, scrunching up, squeezing, wrinkling, ruffling, Ruckling, roughing, and screwing up. So, so that's the opposite to levelling up. And that is what we have been doing for the last 40 years. Uh, this country was an incredibly level country in the 1970s by the early 1980s. Uh, we were second only to Sweden for income inequality amongst large European countries. Our differences uh, by geographical region were very small. Life expectancy in Sheffield in the 1970s was above average. Um, just to give you an idea, if you, if you didn't know, of just how level a country this was. And we have gone from a position of being one of the most equal countries to becoming the most economically unequal country in Europe, and unequal in all other kinds of ways, by education, by, by geography. But we are not at the most unequal we've ever been. Uh, that is back just over 100 years ago, around about 1912, when the Titanic sank. Um, was when the gaps between people's lives to their incomes was 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 largest. Uh, just before Lady uh, Brideshead Revisited was written, and I had an image when I when I thought what I'd talk about here of a map which I'm not going to show you. You have to imagine it. But you can imagine it from from where you live. It's a map from where I grew up in Oxford, and it's a map of the houses, and you can see each individual house. And that the map comes from 1912, but the map was produced after the First World War. And there was a dot in each house if a man went to fight in the First World War. And that dot is coloured black if the man died. Now, what, sh what shocked me when I saw this map from over 100 years ago of the area where I grew up is that most houses had a dot in them. Most houses, somebody went and fought in the First World War. It is possible to be very, very unequal, but have enormous patriotism and a high level of community spirit, which I think they have then, uh, or you're almost forced to go to fight in some cases. But then the really shocking thing was not that almost every house had a man who'd gone to fight in the First World War, but that the black dots for the men who didn't come back were almost exclusively in the terraced houses, in the smaller houses, not in the end terraces, not in the semi-detached, 
and certainly not in the detached houses in Oxford, but it was the, it was the terraced houses. Now, the First World War and the flu of 1918-19 was much worse than what we have now, but there is a similarity with what we've just gone through. Uh, and in terms of levelling, uh, the first thing you, you, you need to know is that in the last 12 months, we have done the opposite to levelling up, uh, principally because of the pandemic. ONS have produced figures by social class showing that if, if you are in a low paid job, you can be five or six times more likely to have died of COVID than if you have a job like mine. And it's not so much to pay, it's that in my job I hardly meet anybody now physically. Whereas somebody working at a, at a till in the supermarket will meet thousands of people every day. Uh, but with social class, we have these enormous differences from the pandemic. Uh, a study came out from Sheffield Hallam University a few weeks ago, showing that the pandemic has affected geographically most the coalfield areas and areas that were poorest to begin with. Um, those who have the most cases, I saw a graph the other day on Twitter showing a very clear correlation between voting Labour in December 2019 and the pandemic. Now, of course, you don't get the disease because you voted Labour. Voting Labour uh, is more common in areas that are poorer and areas that are poorer have been much more affected overall by the amount of pandemic. Not at first, at first it was people coming back from Ibiza, clubbing and skiing. But very quickly it moved out of those areas uh, and across the rest of the country. And as you'll, you'll almost certainly know, people have been most affected financially people who've been living on 80% of their normal income or less, uh, the 1.8 million that Standard Life have identified have, have lost a third of their income and have no recourse to public funds. Um, they have done terribly, while at the other end of the scale, people have been able to save more and are just waiting to spend their money flying abroad on holiday. So there have been absolutely no levelling up. The government cannot entirely blame uh, the pandemic for this. They could have done things differently if they had wanted to and been able to. I'm maybe being a bit cruel there, but I don't think they actually had it in them to do a better job um, than this. But certainly nobody should believe, you, nobody should believe when they say that there has been any levelling up to date. Why doesn't the pandemic compare with world wars, even World War II? Because although we have the worst record in the world, only 18 people have died out of every 10,000 who were alive at the start of the pandemic, 18 out of 10,000. It is the worst record in the world, but it is not the same as a world war. The highest death rate has been for people in their 90s, 5% have died. But ageing is so rapid that we aren't going to actually get a drop in people aged over 90. It is going to stay steady for one year, but no actual drop. Let's go back to when we were most unequal, time of the First World War, when the differences were huge, not just income differences, but differences, say, in things like unemployment and the rates across different parts of the country, or health differences, where we actually had a bimodal distribution. Well, in the 1920s and 1930s, people worked very, very hard to improve things locally. And we actually saw a decline in inequalities. Nobody noticed at the time so we had levelling up without people thinking there was levelling up uh, occurring back then. Half of the equality that we gained by the 70s occurred before uh, the Second World War. What is inequality and what is equality about? And I'm speeding on because I'm, I'm most interested in your questions. I saw an advert this morning for Comic Relief. And in Comic Relief they have, uh, I think it's the words like justice and uh, inequality being shrunk in their latest kind of logo so it's interesting to watch uh the the awareness of this uh rise but i'm not quite sure that the people who've designed the logo for comic comic relief quite understand the difference between say poverty and inequality uh poverty is being poor and not having things inequality is about a gap between people and reducing that gap and you can't just reduce the gap by levelling everybody up from the bottom and giving them all, say, what Posh and Becks have. It's not possible. Uh, I was recently asked if I'd do a talk about levelling up Oxfordshire. And I produced a map for the person asking me to do it. 
showing all the areas of Oxfordshire that have been the best off fifth of the country and all the areas of Oxfordshire which have been the worst off fifth. And a lot of Oxfordshire is in the best off fifth. We have manor houses out there in the countryside. Uh, we only have a couple of estates left in the city of Oxford that have not yet been gentrified. Um, what did they be by levelling up Oxfordshire? And what they meant, the person inviting me was, how can the new motorway, the Oxford Cambridge Arc, supposedly make increase equality for poor people in Oxfordshire? Um, and I, I smiled wryly at the thought that building a new motorway, you know, other than opportunities for road protesters, it's quite hard to see. You know, I try not to be too cynical. But we're in this really weird era where people want to use the words levelling up for everything. Without kind of knowing that we did it before, we did it in the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s and 1970s. That's a lot of history of levelling up. We were more equal at the end of each of those decades than the beginning. Most other countries in Europe have levelled up. They're all more level than we are. If you want to know what levelling up is, you just simply look right across the channel if you're interested in how to be more level. But at least we have the aspiration uh, to do it at, at the moment. Uh, let me begin to set sum up so that I keep to my promise of not talking uh, for too long. Um, community power and, and local action is, is, I think, really interesting and is part of the secret of what, what did work before and what worked in particular cities uh, in the 1920s and 30s. It was public health officials demanding levelling up. It was slum clearances back then going on. All, all of that happened before the 1945 Labour government. That's one thing I want you to remember. For people who think, oh, you can't get a levelling without a national government that is actually truly committed to levelling rather than just pretending that they care, um, we did it before. So you don't necessarily need a national government that, that does that. But where do you need it? What kind of things do you need to begin to look at? And, and this is where it gets slightly depressing when you look at the, the level of, of inequalities. If you look at something like education, we have the most unlevel education system in Europe, in fact, even less equal than in the United States of America. Now, there isn't much you can do in the short term about it, but you can at least be aware of that. And you can be aware there is nowhere else in Europe where a quarter to a third of all resources go on just 7% of kids at, seven, at secondary school level. That's our private schools. They don't, it just doesn't happen elsewhere. What you shouldn't say is, oh, we want all children to have the quality of education of private schools in England. And there are several reasons why you shouldn't say this. One is, they're not that good. They're not that good compared to European education, which is cheaper and better not simply about how many languages people in the mainland of Europe can speak, but how much better they are at maths and so on. Uh, British universities refuse to have our children, students, sorry, tested on international comparisons, partly because we know how badly they'd look when compared to the French or Germans, the Swedes or Finns. But secondly, it's incredibly expensive. No country could actually afford to spend that much money on all its children. So, you, so don't talk about giving everybody supposedly what I don't know, Jacob Rees, Moggs and Boris Johnson had. It isn't a very good education and it is very expensive. But you have to work slowly towards that and you have to work out that you're working against the grain of a system which has academised our schools, which says that all new schools need, need to be a, a free school and so on, that you can't think about others, you've got to think about just your area. Um, and this is going to be tricky. I've got no time to talk about housing and health. I'll just end up with one little story about local communities or, or how things do change in a pandemic. About two years ago, a man died on my street. I live on quite a long street, um, but it's a fairly personal street and an old man died. Nobody knew he died. It wasn't until the postman noticed that the post was uh, piling up uh, and notified the police that the police broke in and found that he died many weeks earlier. This is a tragic story, but actually it was a pretty, pretty common story across Britain. We had lots of elderly people dying. I think Michael Marmot talked about the austerity in the cuts. He may not have told you that that actually resulted in a big rise in people dying and not being found um, then. And it happened on, on my street and my street is not a poor street. But in the way of a classic British street, it is not a particularly friendly street either. Um, not average. Come the pandemic, 
things change a bit. The street gets a WhatsApp group. People begin to check on other people. People begin to do the shopping for people who are not allowed out. And so we get a different situation. We get a situation in which people are very worried about a disease, particularly elderly people, but in which at least no more would somebody actually die and their body not be found. And that is the change. And what we need to do is to begin to take that change, that idea that we are actually connected to each other more than we thought and we, and we need to use it, rather than to avert to what we had uh, before the pandemic, which was a very, very terrible situation at the end of years of, of austerity. Uh, that is just under 15 minutes. It's more than 10. It's, it's, it's enough uh, to get you going. Please ask me anything you want. I'm really interested in what you're interested in. Thanks, Danny. I wasn't, I wasn't counting. I wasn't watching the clock. That was really, really interesting. And, and you touched on a lot of issues that I think um, we, can, we can really delve into in the discussion. Can I just ask you one really um, micro thing, which is just that a couple of people have said you're sounding quite quiet. I don't know whether you could speak closer or, yeah. I, okay. Is perfect. That better? perfect hopefully it will be yeah thanks very much I'm sure we're here in the chat if it isn't um so I there's a question that caught my eye from John Topham he said is inequality primarily caused by politicians and government policy um and it kind of reflected on something that I was kind of thinking of when you were talking which is about you saying that actually the the kind of greatest time for leveling up was the 20s and 30s and actually, obviously, at post-war, we had the kind of great, determined, ambitious state, beverage state and welfare state created and, and, and uh, different forms of government interventions thereafter. So, so can you just talk a little bit more about your, yeah, what's the relationship between government policy and tackling inequality and, 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 and does it do more harm than good? It can do. Uh, and, it, and it's all tricky. And a lot of it has to do for Britain with, with our position in empire which makes us slightly odd compared to other countries in Europe. And it's one reason why we may have, well, why we were so, so incredibly equal 100 years ago, because we could afford to be. We could only afford such a well-off aristocracy because we had the empire. That made, that made those differences uh, possible. Um, and then experiences. Uh, so it was, um, well, Beveridge himself and his best friend, Tawny, both fighting in, I think they both fought in the Somme. Tawny was, was laid in um, no man's land for a day in the Somme. Uh, R.H. Tawny, who's the most famous academic writing about equality in the 20s and 30s. They both went to rugby school. They were both uh, born in India, in the Raj, Beveridge, who wrote the Beveridge Report and Tawny. So the upper classes in the First World War learnt something. They mixed for the first time. And, and that has the effect because they have power. Okay. Attlee in 1945, again, like Corbyn, posh boys. You know, Labour, anyway, I won't go on about this, but okay. um, that all helps. And politicians certainly help. One difficulty we have had since Margaret Thatcher, Margaret Thatcher believed in the tall poppies, she, which is what she called it. She believed in natural inequality. She thought she was particularly personally uh, superior to other people. She said so. Um, she believed she got into a grammar school purely out of her own ability and then into Oxford. The irony was she got into Oxford at the time and she wouldn't normally have got into because the men were not allowed in because it was during the Second World War. But anyway, um, and when Boris Johnson talked about top cornflakes, although ironically he got all these numbers wrong because he's no good at maths, um, and I'm happy to say that. But when Boris talked about IQ tests and standard deviations, he was basically outlining his beliefs that some people are superior to others. Uh, and it's a very understandable belief from, you know, if you're if you're sent as a boy to a school that costs £35,000 a year to educate you, the only way you can rationalise that is that there must be some boys that are much more clever than other boys, and it makes money to spend more money on some boys than others. Now, you can do better than that, and some Etonians did, um, but most of them are kind of trapped in that, that way of, of thinking. And, of course, you're brought up and told that we've made you special. You're special to begin with. Although, of course, if you're put down at birth, that really isn't passing the intelligence test. Um, but so, so we do have politicians who believe in, in inequality, fundamentally believe in inequality. They don't say to their electorate that, um, because you don't tend to vote for somebody who tells you that you're stupid. But it is a problem, and it is a particular problem in Britain, uh, and it does always reassert itself. Um, and it changes. You know, we're, we're learning a lot more about ability, intelligence, inheritance. 
all the time. It was very hard 100 years ago not to believe that some people were more equal than others. And just to be fair to the Conservatives, uh, Labour were very bad at this. Sidney Webb, who wrote the first Clause 4 for the Labour Party, uh, along with Beatrice's partner, they, they both believed in eugenics. And there's a eugenic uh, element in the Clause 4, which was workers by hand or by brain, something like that, because you have two kinds of workers. That was in the original Clause 4 of the Labour Party. Tony Blair managed to put an, an equivalent eugenic thing into the new Clause 4 without realising it. But it was something about, oh, everybody can reach their potential, with the implication being that people have different potentials. You know, because straight out of 1920s, 30s eugenics. And, and modern science brilliantly shows us that this really, really doesn't exist. Toby Young believes in it, of course. Um, I think I won't mean, slander it, but it really, really you really don't have a set of gold children destined for greatness and all you've got to do is find them and put them in power uh, and if you like one tragedy of Britain is is we've kind of demonstrated that in practical purposes by putting the supposed gold children in power then getting Brexit massive cuts life expectancy falling since 2014 no one else in Europe did that infant mortality rising you know if you want to practically prove uh, that but it's not just Britain, you can go and look at Trump, you can look at Brazil, you, around the world you can find countries that have done this kind of uh, thing where particularly men who think they're particularly able um, have done quite a lot of damage to the country they're in charge of. Um, I'll try and be more diplomatic in the rest, but there is a fundamental problem. There are politicians who believe in inequality and think it's a good thing. They, could, they think it drives invention. Um, well, they have all kinds of weird beliefs, which no data backs up at all. Uh, and you said earlier, I, I wrote a book recently with my, my colleague Anika on, um, on Finland. Finland, one of the most equal countries in Europe, has, has the lowest infant mortality rate, the most patents per head, the most inventions, the children who can speak the most languages, the lowest homelessness rate, I can go on and on. The irony to me is, it's not as if the data is difficult. It's not, it's not as if it's subtle. It's, it's not a kind of like, like, oh, Britain's good at this, but not good at that, you know. It's pretty obvious the more equal countries of Europe do really, really well, and the most unequal do pretty badly, mm. uh, which is why levelling up really matters. And at least now, the language is being used. I am just very, very suspicious of the motives uh, of the people who came up with the slogan in the first place. Mm. That's really interesting. And I guess... Um... Just reflecting, reflecting on your comments as well. You haven't said the word class, but it, it, um, th that's obviously at the background of a lot of this and peculiar to Britain as a country. I guess what's happened since the vote to leave the EU and the, the kind of rise and coining of the levelling up agenda is that we seem to be talking a little bit more about place as a factor of inequality. Uh, we, we, Lots of us have seen the data about how many kind of London tube stations you need to go down and your life chances decrease or um, uh, and the consequences of place uh, for your for your outcomes. Can you just talk a little bit more about that and how you see the kind of intersection of uh, pockets of deprivation as, as being significant um, in terms of inequality? Um, well, we are unusual on this. We're not just unusual regionally. So, so the country in Europe after Britain with the most with the biggest regional divides was was Germany. And that was the Eastern Lander, which of course the gap between the East and the West has reduced dramatically in Germany. So it's possible, and then and then Italy. Uh, but we have bigger regional divides. But then when you look within our cities, our cities are all incredibly unequal. So life expectancy differences in Sheffield between wards twenty years, um, and city, British cities kind of compete. There's an atlas of inequality. They compete for which is the most unequal. You know, people, academics say, oh, I grew up in Leeds, you know, there's this street here. It's only half a mile between this and this. Uh, and there's a, there's a particular one in Birmingham. And I, I can almost tell you the streets in each city. But when you, when you step out and look, they have a remarkable similarity in inequality. And cities in other countries, there's inequality everywhere, but they have a slope which is similar to each other and different. Uh, just to give you a last example on schools, um, I live in Oxford, southeast, quite posh uh, town, six big state schools, uh, but about a quarter to a third of 15 year olds going private in a whole load of tiny little private schools. Uh, I asked a colleague from Bonn, Oxford is twinned with Bonn in Germany, 
if he could if he could match the schools for me with the schools in Bonn. You know, here's the lowest ranked school, hardly anybody goes to university. What's the equivalent in Bonn? Here's the next, here's the next. And he made it. I thought he could do it, although the differences have been last. He just couldn't do it. He, there are differences. He said the Beethoven Academy School is for the posh Conservative Party leaders, you know, so in, in Bonn. Um, but when it came to the private sector, he went, oh, that school, that's the one where your Prince Philip went to. It was rather slow boys from the upper classes. Mm-hmm. Um, and th- that difference between... In Oxford, there is exactly, a, almost exactly £100,000 between each state secondary school. You have to pay £100,000 more for your house as you move between catchment areas before you get into the private sector. And that difference bet- between that and the idea of just Germany providing a fairly decent education, even though they have divisions at, at the particular ages, uh, was enormous. And it's class. We have this, we didn't lose a war. That's part of our problem with our class system. Um, and we didn't have a revolution. It's been a long time. Uh, and at one extreme, the families that William the Conqueror gave land to in Devon still own it. Uh, and, and this is it's something we're going to have to get over at some point. Uh, but it is, it is very, very uh, tricky. And the class differences have got bigger. Uh, so a colleague today was arranging, wanting to arrange a seminar with the Medical Research Council about the woman who actually did the best work on, on common cold which really matters because it's a coronavirus. And she did this work at Port and Down, she was working class, and we were, we were trying to arrange um, who could speak. And I, and I said to him, you do realise it's now far harder for, I, I'm a middle-class boy, by the way. Uh, I say class because I lived in Newcastle for 10 years. Um, <laughs> it's far, far harder for a working-class person to become an academic now than it was then. Uh, for start, you've got to have the money to pay for your master's degree, which you just can't do, so that's it, you're out. But even if you manage to get a master's degree before your PhD, um, you've got to be able to afford to live near a university. And again, without middle class parents, you can't do that. And you've got to be able to get your way through the precarious research career, which you can't do without the money. Um, so it's 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 not a good. There's a lot of leveling that needs to be done, mm. um, uh, and it's not a good situation uh, that we're in. And it has terrible effects for the well off as well because they have to go to university. You can't not. Uh, in fact, there are actually a couple of streets in London where the majority of children go to Oxford and Cambridge. Um, and not going is not an option. And that, that does force people into certain directions that they might not necessarily want to go otherwise. And also, if your mum and dad are very well off, people always get angry when I'm sympathetic about the rich, but, there's only a number of careers you can go into that will get you a salary of over £100,000. I'm afraid it's going to have to be law or the city. You know, forget what you actually care about. Um, so, so inequality ha- harms people at the top. Perhaps slightly more seriously about this, if, if people are doubting it and thinking, I'd like to have their problem or their money. When we look at uh, pill taking and antidepressants in America, places like Beverly Hills are the highest. Um, so the very well off in America actually have some of the worst mental uh, health of all. Mm. Um, I mean, it, it leads on to a question from Marianne, actually, who's asked, why should we tackle inequality specifically as, a, as separate to poverty? Do you, how do you tackle each? Do you tackle them both in the same way? Are there differences? Are we to level up? Do we need to level down in certain ways? Um, and, 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 how, and how do you tackle some of the consequences of those on the less equal end of it? Lack of money, lack of resource. Um, yeah, and this is still a fundamental debate in Britain. The Joseph Rowntree Foundation, who, who funded me at one point, were very happy talking about poverty, but really didn't want to talk about inequality. And that's the JRF. Um, I would say that if you just talk about poverty, you're never going to make much of a dent to poverty, because poverty is fundamentally caused by inequality. Um, it's the Peter Townsend definition of being able to partake in the norms of society, and then those norms are set by how unequal society is. Uh, so everybody wants to reduce poverty. You have hardly, well, you'd have to be a sociopath, wouldn't you, to say, I want to see more people poor. It's kind of like too, too easy. Um, but it's also largely kind of meaningless. Um, it's those countries that have reduced inequality that have much lower actual rates of poverty. It's kind of almost as simple as that. Well, t- take something like school meals. You know, and the whole brilliant Marcus Rashford campaign and, you know, can we feed our children over the summer holidays rather than starving? In Finland, you know, it's not utopia, but they've had free school meals 
since the 1940s. And since the late 1940s, they've had free meals in holidays in Helsinki. And they're not called free school meals. They're just called food, which you get at school, like you get a chair and a table. Because there's no, why on earth wouldn't you feed all the children at school? Um, you know, we introduced our school meals because we lost the Boer War, because our soldiers were too scrawny. Uh, you know, not that we cared about people, but we actually cared about beating South Africans. Um, and that's a very empire thing. So you, you don't get rid of food poverty by giving people food in the school holidays, although it helps temporarily. And like Joseph Rowntie said when he set up the Joseph Rowntie Foundation, soup kitchens don't actually get rid of poverty although they're useful. And tragically, we've gone back to soup kitchens again, of course. It's by doing things such as what the Finns did and making sure that all children get food at school that you get rid of food poverty. It's reducing the inequality. That's mm. what does it. Um, and it's because, not least, the inequalities are unjustified. Uh, you will end up with a far, far better uh, nation, a far better set of scientists, academics, workers, uh, if you treat people better. And just to get into the nitty gritty of it slightly, because you might be thinking, why Finland? Why not talking about Sweden, Norway, or Denmark? Finland is different from the other Nordic nations, and they actually spend more on the bottom quarter of children, which has to, uh, effects enough to be able to say, oh, look, they're doing better than Norwegians. And, you know, it's not hard to sort of see why spending more on the education of the bottom quarter is more effective overall. Kids who are quicker can get on by themselves. They don't need extra help. No matter, in Britain, in our class-bound society, you endlessly hear, my special child needs extra help from people who are in the best off quarter of society. Well, you might feel like that. And in an unequal country, you desperately want your child to get into the top quarter or top 10th. Otherwise, they're gonna have a very rough life. Mm. Um, but it's not true that they actually do need more. Um, they need to live in a society which actually understands how things work far better and you need to get your society towards that and that takes decades of work. And what's um, Michael Kendall's asked why is Finland more radical about this agenda so what's I mean, you can't transplant the Finnish way to the British way but what what could we what could we learn from we them? Learn... What, what do the public think what's what's different? Well it, it, it again often historical reasons the kind of opposite historical reasons to Britain Finland was a colony colony of Sweden, colony of Germany, colony of Russia, uh, it, not the heart of an empire. But the Finns actually, the radical Finns came over in the 1960s to the USA and to Britain to look at what we did to copy it. They came to look at our comprehensive schools that we were introducing at the time, and then later introduced them into Finland. Um, so part of it is, is um, realizing that actual effort and agency and political action at particular times has, has an effect and, and did. But other reasons were that Finland suffered from great emigration. If you didn't look after the poorest, they would just simply leave and other people wouldn't come. Whereas if you have easy immigration like the USA, like us, well, until we cut our nose off despite our face, um, if people are endlessly coming to your country, you can treat the poor really badly because there's an endless supply of new poor immigrants coming. And Finland had the opposite people would leave Finland to go to Canada uh, and other places. So you had to treat your population well, otherwise you lost them. And I think that mattered. But also, also the Finns learned over time that this actually made everybody better off. Um, but perhaps just to be a bit fair to other factors, sitting next to Russia in the Cold War, literally next to Russia, does kind of bring you all together a bit. To how can we make this country work better? Um, uh, and that, you know, those kinds so of things have an effect. Some situations we might not want, want to replicate yeah. yes. exactly. Um, so I'm just aware we've got a very uh, practical audience, lots of people working in councils, lots of people working active in, in the voluntary sector, local communities. So we've got a few questions from different folk saying, what, what can you do locally? What can you do on a community level to begin to, to address inequality? Um, and what would you say what the one of um, Marcia here said, what your one or two thoughts on what local councils can do to encourage levelling up? What, what can be done from the grassroots up? Um, Realising that even the smallest thing is worthwhile, rather than saying, you know, we can't be Scandinavia straight away. Um, 
simple stuff like, like and again happened in the pandemic, uh, cutting off particular streets from traffic, uh, a bit um, often not popular, uh, but those streets are often the streets in the middle of cities and the poorer areas used as rat runs by other people. Uh, cutting off and the people in cars tend to be better off than people not in cars. So something like blocking off a street from, from traffic, uh, it will reduce health inequalities between children, it'll improve health overall, uh, and it invariably actually benefits the people who are worse off more than people who are better off, because people who are worse off are much more likely to walk, cycle, or use a bus uh, than, than to drive. So, and it's the cost of a concrete block that you put in the middle of the road, but also putting up with the car brigade um, who are, you know, very ferocious about their rights uh, to drive past children trying to get to school. Uh, so, so the small things at, at first um, that, that you can do. And then looking, looking at things like your school system, trying to support the primary schools if you can, if they're, if they're still under your local authority control, um, trying try to support the primary schools because it doesn't take much to turn the image of a primary school one way or the other. One problem about being such a class-based country and such an unequal country is we then have this paranoia about schools and about where my child goes to school and which primary school, which then goes and dams entire areas, which then has you know, further and further effects. Um, so, so little things that can help at the edges, I'm afraid that's where we are at with our budgets and, and what we're actually able to do. Uh, and lastly, thinking about the kind of leaflets that councillors produce. So my council in Oxford, which I, I generally quite like the councillors in Oxford, but they did produce one leaflet about affordability, uh, showing the prices of how much it costs to, to rent houses, which basically said, go live in Swindon. Now, that, that kind of thing isn't particularly helpful. What they should have said is, it's, it's very unfair and it needs to change. Not, don't worry, you can work in Oxford as long as you live in Swindon. It's a hell of a commute from Oxford to Swindon. There's no direct train. Um, and this is a kind of exporting of your poor out. Uh, and there was criticism, I grew up in Oxford as a child, there was criticisms in Oxford 50 years ago that we were building council estates on the edge of the city, tipping the poor up and out of sight, but making sure we still had our cleaners. And watching that happen, but even further afield. And that's just a council leaflet. Uh, council's attitude to homeless. It's been interesting watching that change over time from councils putting in orders so that the police can move homeless people on to councils suddenly realizing actually most of the homeless people who die, they grew up in the area, they're local. That's where you come back. So without money, councils can do a lot of harm without much money and they can do a lot of help. There's an enormous amount um, that, that, that they can do that doesn't cost very much. But they have been, you know, most of you, if you're working in councils, you would know it's decimation. And decimation again and again and again. And decimation means a tenth. Council funding was dec decimated four or five times over since 2010. Um, it's the size of city councils. It's utterly unbelievable. I think, I won't get the numbers right, but maybe six or 700 people working in the council of, of my city of 150,000 people. There were more people employed in my geography department and the chemistry block opposite it in the university than in the whole of the city council. Um, it's unbelievably, well, efficient, but terrible. But just think what you could do if you decided you were actually going to fund and people councils in the way in which they're funded elsewhere in Europe. Just what could be done if we did decide that. And practically, and this government may begin to move in this way, the claimant count has absolutely shot up by between a million and two million. Doesn't count on the un unemployment official statistics, but we have huge numbers of people out of work. We have half a million people behind in paying the rent who are facing eviction. And so we, we have a catastrophe on, on the corner. And central government can either let it happen or it can begin to try to ameliorate it so that it isn't de providing over that. And that'll be local uh, councils. Uh, that would do that. Now, mm. it may take central government some time to realise that they have this choice, um, but they've pushed back furlough again and again and again. You know, they've kept the £20 for the moment on universal credit, admittedly it's going to go in September. Um, it's 
it feels like 1920s to me, you know. Um, uh, some fairly ill informed politicians slowly beginning to get it that you've got a problem uh, and, it, and that problem's getting bigger. Okay, well, that, that leads me on um, to the final question that I did want to ask you. We've been playing a bit of um, fantasy cabinet at the Stronger Things conference in the chat. I think um, yesterday there were calls for Donna Hall, our chair, to become prime minister. I think someone asked Michael Marmot, um, could he be king uh, this morning? I think he'd probably be better off as health secretary. But can you talk about government policy? If you were, if you could be chancellor in this um, fantasy cabinet, what would what would Chancellor Dorling do? What are the three things that you'd do immediately um, to, <laughs> to tackle right. inequality? They'd hate that because I'm a geographer, not an economist. Um, <laughs> <laughs> if I were, if I was chancellor, um, <laughs> I. I would, I'm afraid, have to scrap the scheme that gives money to, to North Yorkshire rather than to Sheffield and Barnsley, because it's just too crude and obvious. Um, so, so go back to the 1934 Special Areas Act and actually give money to areas that need it rather than areas that voted for me. Um, I would uh, look at the work of Thomas Piketty and see that you need to have uh, taxes at higher rate for very high earners otherwise things just go to the dogs in your country and that has to happen um, and it's entirely possible to pay the tax because it's paid on, on the earnings and then lastly I would look at our levels of benefits which are half what they were in real terms compared to the early 1980s uh, and begin to return uh, those to what they were so that for, when you have a pandemic people actually can afford to isolate and they're not facing a choice between starvation and, and isolating uh, that would just be the first uh, free, free that I, I do um, but it you know it wouldn't be easy and and so one last thing to say about fantasy cabinets it, it's a good route to go down and I think it's much better than thinking about fantasy prime ministers uh, because whenever the country has had big jolts forward that have been very good it hasn't been a particular prime minister that's done it it's been a cabinet with a really good health secretary like Bevan uh, or a minister like Barbara Castle, uh, and, and so on. And it's entire cabinets of, of strong people with a commitment to equality that moves things forward, not single hero politician prime ministers, uh, which don't tend to help of either political party. Um, so working together is not about superhero single politicians. That is a brilliant note to end on. It's absolutely in keeping with the collaborative nature of community power and, and, and leadership from, from the ground up. Um, but thank you so much, Danny. Um, uh, the session's gone way too quick. I haven't um, been able to ask half the questions that have been in the chat, um, but really hope um, everybody's enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Danny, um, for taking the time to be with us. It's been a real pleasure. Um, and now I'm going to hand back to Adam, who will tell us what's next in the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Danny and Jessica as well. Uh, such an interesting uh, conversation. I'm getting more and more taken by this idea of a community power alternative cabinet. I don't know how we could make that work, but I just love to bring together that group of people to talk about alternative solutions to the big challenges we face. We'll, we'll think about that one within a uh, new local.